There it is. Okay, got it. Excellent. So, um, who can tell me what do you think a performance based task is? Why are you here? Uh, is it because you have no idea? Because you, you're curious about that? Because it's something that you already do and you want to just find out more about it? Why are you here? Can I ask you? It's probably something I already do. Um, okay. It's probably just knowing how to assess it properly and how to get the most from the kids. Okay. Is learning. Perfect. So, so you're interested in the performance base basically on the online experience or you want to use that even later on? Um, I'd like to use it now because I've been trying to trial things that would work for home learning tasks when we go back to school. Because okay. I think what remote learning is proving to us is that the home can engage a lot more than we think they do and we can maybe up the, the level of tasks that we set at home rather than just a quick homework, just to tick a box. So I think having... Okay. So, sounds good, sounds good. Mind structure, yeah. Sounds good, so let's, let's have a look. So what we're going to do in this, in this session, we're going to have these three big objectives. Some of them are pretty much IB related, but again, you can just use them the way you want. It doesn't have to be uh, related completely. But what, first, the first thing we're going to do is try to discuss um, what do we understand by summative tasks. Um, formative tasks, when do we assess, why do we assess, what's the point, do we have to give grades every time we assess, do we just have to give feedback. So we're going to discuss about the design principles of the summative assessments, the types of tasks that we can use. We're going to try to make a relationship between what we call in the MYP the statement of inquiry and the task that we're proposing. So many people, what they do is they plan backwards, which means they start with a task, and from the task, they develop their unit. It's a way of doing it. Or maybe it's just trying to make that statement of inquiry meaningful. So try to see how can it be part of the summative final task, right? And then finally, we're going to try to see how can we create performance-based tasks and uh, uh, task-specific clarifications and see how it works. But before that, I'm sure that I'm going to give you a few hints of things that you already know is that I always think that sometimes we go to sessions based on education, there's lots of theories which are very beautiful, but we forget who do we have in our classrooms and why do we need to adapt the tasks to whoever we have in our classrooms. So I don't know you guys, but I belong to that generation, the baby boom generation. Um, um, so we are probably a more, a more traditional generation with different learning styles and learning strategies. So as you can see, if we compare between our generation of the one that they have nowadays, then that is a little bit different. And there are many things that we need to take into consideration. What we have in our classrooms is what we call Generation Z. I'm sure you've heard about that, which, which is a list or a bunch of visual learners, most of them. If not visual, they will be pretty much kinesthetic. They want to try. They want to make sure that what they try and they see, it works. They like to work in collaboration. Um, they like to um, um, use devices, use technology. Most of them, 92% of the time, are online. And strangely enough, resources, investigations say that they have eight seconds attention span. Uh, so that's something that we need to take into consideration. It's quite scary, eight seconds attention span. So which means that most of you, if you were Generation Z, you will fall asleep now already because we've been more than, more than two minutes talking here. Yeah, and they Would have, have made an avatar. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, I can tell you. Uh, they, they, they believe that technology helps them to learn, and it's probably true, because they use more than 10 hours of tech a day. I'm not saying they are in front of the screens for more than 10 hours, but between the telephone and social media. So please be aware that that's what we have in our classroom. So every time we're going to create a task, summative, formative, whichever task we're going to create, we need to remember who's our audience. So we need to produce a task that is challenging, motivating, engaging for these profile of students. And that's what we, do, what we need to keep in mind. And that's what we're looking for. What I'm going to say is probably against the principle of this session. I'm not going to say that the performance-based tasks are the best ones ever. I'm just saying that for the type of students we have nowadays, it's possibly the one that works the best across the subjects. I'm going to use examples of history, visual arts. I don't have anything for design. Uh, I, don't know, I don't have anything for maths. 
uh, or for sciences. But if you look on the website, I have a, a slide with resources at the end. Feel free to just go and, and, and hunt. There are many, many things out there. Okay. So if we move on, if this thing lets me move on. Yes. Uh, this is how they learn. There was a study done by Barnes and Nobles College, and that's what the students say. 12% they learn only listening. So forget about it. Forget about the master class when you teach and they listen. Forget about lecturing. 38% listen or, sorry, they learn by seeing. So with a book, with a video, with a, a poster, with a picture. So yeah, it can't work. 51%, which is more than half of them, they learn by doing. So practicing things. And that's why when we talk about performance-based tasks, those are tasks that will request the students to perform, to do something, to make a link with real life situations. And that fits perfectly into this majority of the Generation Z, which are uh, uh, these kinesthetic doing learners. So once we have this clear, um, a few definitions of what performance-based tasks are. This is the one that I like the most, but it's up to you. Basically, it's a learning activity that asks students to perform, to demonstrate, and what they have to demonstrate is many things. It's not only knowledge, but understanding, skills development, uh, metacognition, uh, capacity of thinking about their production of work, and so on. It, this performance-based task is tangible which means it can be seen, it can be listened to, it can be even touched if you want in some cases. Because this assessment task has an evidence and the evidence is not a piece of paper with the teacher's feedback and students answering to certain questions. So we'll talk about a type of task that asks students to perform, which is tangible and which gives us evidence of what the students do. So if we keep this in mind, uh, um, and I've put on bold the, the, the big ways, the big words to define these performance-based tasks. It's pretty much the development of skills. Knowledge as well, but I will probably focus more on skills. There's not a correct answer, which means they're open-ended questions, open-ended tasks, and that's something that students like. Uh, they cannot be wrong. They will not be right. They can be right if their process fits into what they're doing but there's not a wrong or a right answer. It's contextualized, which means that it's based on real life situations. And that's something that they like. They like to see, you know, maybe it happened to you long ago, but I was in the math class doing so many times things that I just thought, why do I need these? When in, when in my life I'm going to need these complex mathematical formulas? Um, if the teachers are able to make a link between what happens in class in real life, all of a sudden we have the student motivation. And those performance-based tasks allows us to do that. They are based on transferable skills. So whatever they do on that task, they will be able to apply in other circumstances. They're very, very good to integrate subjects. So if you're an MYP school and you need to work on interdisciplinary projects, go for these. Go a performance-based task. They really help to integrate the knowledge of many subjects together. And of course, the precise rubrics that need to be presented at the beginning of the task. And I'm going to use many examples later on, even one that we're doing with our students online, and it has worked pretty well, I would say. So, good performance-based tasks. That's what you need to think about. They require students to be critical thinkers, to solve a problem, and to use their metacognition. Now, I hate when I go to a session and somebody's talking to me about words that I don't even know what they mean. Any idea what metacognition means, guys? Any of you wants to share what metacognition is? Um, if I could, uh, you know, define it simplistically, I think it's the understanding that the knower, the student, uh, has about his or her own thinking and the process of processing information and um, in what direction their, their thinking is going. So taking charge of their own learning. I, I don't know. I, I mean, that could be. I think it's a great definition. Anything to add? Yeah, so that, that it is. Metacognition is thinking about your thinking, is reflecting about what you're <laughs> doing. And what I think is very important is in any task we propose, and in particular these ones, please spend 
one of the sessions, in particular the last one where you're going to assess the task, to ask the students to reflect on the process. Not on the product, be careful, on the process. So the product will be the evidence, whatever they're going to show, present, perform, display, record, whatever it is. Ask them all the time to reflect on the process. What have you learned from it? What were the difficulties? What skills have you developed? Um, do you have any success criteria? How can you make things better the next time that you're going to produce something like that? And I think the metacognition part of this performance-based task is crucial to make, to give sense to what happens in the classroom. So this is what I was going to do, but luckily enough, uh, one of you, uh, 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 Priyo Darshini, gave the right answer, is the thinking about thinking. That's the metacognition. So keep this in mind, because in the examples that I will be asking with you, uh, um, I'll be using here, I will probably ask you questions about when do you think the student has been asked to think? And what activities do you think are proposed for the students to think about what they're doing? So um, the first thing that I would like you to do in a minute, I would like you to step back and reflect. You, if you were a student, how do you learn? I would like you to think, have you ever tried to learn using a strategy that didn't work? How do you know that strategy didn't work? If it didn't work, what have you done to change it? What have you done? Why have you done it? What was the purpose of changing? So this is the whole reflection process that the students need to do before, during, and after the production of any task but in particular, this performance-based task. They must be invited on a weekly basis or in every session to reflect. So you will see that the tasks that I'm going to propose are long, they can be done in a week, two, three, four weeks. It's important that they're very long. Every week you set many deadlines where you ask the students to reflect. What have you done up to now? And what goes next? Then after that, what are you going to do? Are you going to go back? Can you start from scratch? Can you start over? Are you happy with the process? So it's important that they have the time to think and it's important that they have the time to change, to go back and change their task. But for that, they will need extra time and they will need lots of support from you, which means that they don't have to be scared to be mistaken. So based on that, if we have these tasks, let's think about how do you guys assess? And I've stolen this slide from one of the um, um, IB workshops, but, but it's fine. So basically, it's a division between what we consider a formative assessment to be and a summative assessment to be. So I'm sure we can all take it from, okay, let's see, we teach. Each one of us teaches a section, a project, a lesson. Once we teach, we collect evidence. It can be by asking, it can be just by looking at the students, it can be on a written piece of paper, orally. There are many, many ways to collect this evidence. Once we collect it, we analyze the evidence. And from this analysis, we give feedback to the students all the time. Again, written, oral, it doesn't matter. And after that, we adjust our teaching. So based on the evidence, we find out if things go well, go wrong and if they go wrong we adjust we change we adapt that's why we will never teach the same unit over and over and over again because students will always be different and that's for the formative task however for a summative task once we analyze the evidence we make a judgment and then we grade and then we report and we go back into the formative circle of giving feedback adjusting teaching and so on so that's why the MYP wants us to assess, and that's how I think we should be assessing being an IB school or not. That doesn't really matter if you're an IB school, a British curriculum school, national system, it doesn't matter. Formative task is when we give feedback and we adjust. Summative task it is when we grade, we report, and we go back to the formative circle. So once we have clear in our mind, what do we, yeah, tell me, Priyodarshini, 
Hi, um, I had a question. Uh, so I think this, the, the slide before this um, and before this. And so before when this. we ask students, um, this yeah. One? So yeah. how? Do, yeah, this one. Thank you. Uh, when we ask students to reflect on how do I learn? Um, so what? What is your expected, uh, you know, response from students generally? Because honestly, I haven't done this. Uh, I mean, it would be implicitly done, but I haven't directly asked my students. Okay, so how do you learn? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Some schools, what they do is at the beginning of the school year, during the first week. If they have tutor time or if they have a, um, a time dedicated to pastoral aspects, they tend to have the discussion with the students for them to reflect. You know, the, the, the um, Garner's learning styles are a little bit obsolete nowadays, um, but we can take that as a, as a starting point, which means it's a discussion to have with the students, giving them several examples. Um, you can say, okay, guys, I mean, when you, when you have on a, on a daily basis, when do you remember the things the best? When you see them, when you touch them, uh, how do you take notes? Do you use Cornell notes? So those are a list of questions that you can develop on your own and just ask the students to think about that, think about themselves. And I've seen something in a school which I really loved. And it was a teacher who had different, he was using the Garner learning styles, to be honest, and he had a color for each one of them, kinesthetic, visual, and, and, and so on. And he was putting on the top of the desk of every student the color that represented that student. So the teacher knew at a glance how many visual learners had in his class, how many visual, how many kinesthetic, how many. And he was trying to use different teaching strategies to allow each one of them to shine. Now, it's true that that's complicated to do with young students. I'm talking about primary I'm talking about grade six, grade seven, and it's easier to do with the older ones, which have their own reflection process already mature enough to reflect about themselves. Now, I'm sure that you can come up with different ways to ask your students. I would probably invite them on a weekly basis, the beginning of the school year, guys, what we've done today, has it worked for you? And then change the strategy the day after. Guys, what we've done today, was it better than the day before? So try to change your strategies and see how the students react to every different presentation you have. One day you can use a PowerPoint. One day you can use a flipped classroom. One day you can go to a more traditional system using books, using written notes. Another day you can work on collaborative and, and see how the students react the better. So they need to know themselves, but you also need to know them and see how they learn. So the task that you're going to propose is going to be adapted to them. Now, the performance-based task that I'm going to propose later on will allow each one of them to shine in their own way. And then you'll see that and see if I can answer your question along the way. Is that okay? That's absolutely great. Thank you oh, so much. No worries. So, um, um, first thing, when we talk about summative tasks, okay, that's what we're going to be focusing now. Don't look at these because I hate PowerPoints with too many words. Sorry for that. So. A summative task, what we want from the performance-based task, don't forget, is to develop knowledge, develop skills, develop work habits, and in particular, bring the real world into our classroom through a task. This is what we want. This is what you need to keep in mind all the time. So let's move on into the examples. Um, the types of tasks. Research says that performance-based tasks can be any of these types. It can be debates, it can be presentations, portfolios, performances, projects, exhibits and fairs, IDU activities, STEM projects. We have a design teacher with us, and I'm sure that Kay has done many, many projects with her students already, because design is a project-based activity, like visual arts, like performing arts, like drama, like physical and health education. So we have to learn lots of things from those subjects because they are experts in doing projects based, based work. Okay, so go to your schools and hunt and go for meetings with the design people, with the arts people. They're very creative. They have lots of ideas on how to do that. Right. So these are the types of the different performing tasks we have or performance based. And I'm going to use one type. I'm not saying it's the right one. I'm saying it's the one that I use and it works absolutely well. Right. So I don't know if you heard 
uh, about something called grasps tasks. I've heard about that. Well, if nobody says anything, I guess is that you haven't. So, yeah, Priyodarshini, have you heard about that? Yeah, I've heard and used in my class. So, uh, yeah, this is this is a good strategy. It, it is, and this is the one that I'm going to be based on. So maybe probably nothing new for you, but hopefully I will try to link it with the MYP and will give a sense to you. So just for you, this type of grasp activities was proposed by Wiggins and Mike Tidin on the Standing By Design, a book published in 2005, which I really, really advise you to uh, um, um, go and, and have a look at it and read. It's very interesting. So grasp stands by goal, role, audience, situation, product, and standards. This is the main aspect of the task. A grasp task is a task where students are going to reflect and produce something which is going to meet and give an answer to each one of these six aspects. If we talk about MYP, I invite you to use as a goal your statement of inquiry. As it is, you write your statement of inquiry as the goal of the task. Because this is what you want, isn't it? You want your students to understand the meaning and the purpose of your statement of inquiry. It has to be meaningful in a descriptive sense. In the role, the student can take any role except being a student, because he's already a student. The audience is going to be anybody except you. The teacher will not be the audience of that product. The situation is the context of the task. I will give you examples, don't worry. So the situation is a situation where the student is when producing that project. And ideally, that situation should be directly linked with real life. The product or the purpose is the intention. What is going to be the evidence, that tangible evidence that we're talking about at the beginning of this session? That's going to be the product. And the standards is the criteria that you are going to use to assess this project. It can be an MYP already given criteria, or you can create your success criteria, or the students can create their own success criteria. It's up to you to decide. If you're an MYP school and you need to assess certain objectives, go for that. Of course, if you ask the students to produce their own success criteria, this is excellent, because the, pro the metacognition goes even further because the student needs to understand what my product needs, what are the aspects that my product needs to show and, and, and meet for me to be successful. So let's have, let's have a look at, at some examples. This is one of the examples that I use with my grade nine students, which are MYP4s. We are working on Nazi Germany. Okay, we're talking about uh, uh, um, um, the move to global war, Europe in 1940s, and I'm trying to show them sometimes uh, to create some kind of a debate, show them that, you know, Hitler got elected democratically in 1933, so I want them to understand how people can vote for a guy like Hitler, and hopefully they will transfer that with Trump or Bolsonaro in Brazil, or you never know. Um, the thing is that my goal is my statement of inquiry which is the causes of the conflict or the defense of community and personal ideologies. That's what I do. Okay, Priyadar Shini, you have a question? Um, no, I'm just saying that this looks like a wonderful task. I mean, I, I would do this as a student. Okay, do you teach history? I teach history. I teach right. IGCSE <laughs> history and DP history. Okay, then go for it. And then you get in touch with me and tell me how it worked. So basically, yes, absolutely. My, my intention with that, you, and again, um, uh, we're here just to, to share an informal thing. I'm not saying this is great. I'm not saying that you have to do it. Feel free to say, you know, that's rubbish. I don't like it. That's absolutely fine. I'm not going to be offended. Uh, it's just an example. It works for my students, but sometimes it doesn't. So that's my statement of inquiry. What I told my students is, okay, your role, guys, is that you are a German soldier and you've been fighting in the trenches in World War I, uh, or you can be a nurse. Um, you can be a nurse and you are a nurse, again, in the trenches in World War I, or you can be, um, I don't know, a mother, 
a German mother who just lost her son, who was 18 years old and was sent to fight in World War I and got killed. Or maybe you're a soldier, a German soldier, but you're in the trenches and you want to write a letter to your, your lover or your mother or whoever it is. You pick the role. So I give a list of roles and each one of my students will pick the role they want. If they don't like any of the roles that I'm giving them, they will pick whichever role they want. The audience is going to be, in my case, voters in Munich in 1933. So they need to think they are a German soldier coming from war and they have to do something and talk to voters in Munich in 1933. The situation is that you come from war, you find yourself starving with no money and you're as your country is paying lots of fees to the League of Nations because your country is the one to blame for World War I. And you need to produce a speech to convince people to vote for the Nazi party. I'm not telling them, but they are Hitler, because Hitler was a soldier in World War I, and Hitler had a speech in 1933. So that's the reality, but I'm not telling them who they are. So their product is the speech. Their situation is Germany, 1933. Their audience is German people in 1933, and their role is being a German soldier. It's easy to do, or to say, it's not that easy to do. They need time to research what does it mean to be a soldier in World War I. They need to research what's the profile of a German typical guy in 1933. What was the situation in Germany? They need to understand, look at cartoons, sources that I'm going to give them, and they need to go to their, their English teacher to talk about the characteristic of a speech. How do I write a speech? What kind of a language should I write? Can I use this word? Can I use this other word? Who am I talking to? I'm not talking to my teacher. I'm talking to people that I don't know. So on a weekly basis, I'm going to give them mini deadlines. On the first week, they're going to do some research on uh, German population in Munich in 1933. On the second week, they're going to do some research on the life in the trenches. In week three, they're going to discuss with their English teacher. So I'm going to give them mini deadlines and every week, I'm, doing, I'm going to have a conversation, a debating class, when I'm going to ask them to reflect. What have you done? Do you have enough sources? Was it a trustful source? What you've done, was it enough? Are you on the right track? Do you like the role you picked? You want to change it now, because maybe you realize that the one you picked is not that easy. Do you want to do something different? And of course, I gave them their standards for success, which are the criteria that I'm going to assess. A, C, and D, okay? So that's one of the examples. That's one of the examples. It worked very well. The older the students are, the more freedom you give them in picking a role. If you do that with grade six, you, you may wanna tell them who they are and what do you want the product to be. So it depends on the maturity of your students. You will realize the grade six, they need more precise guidelines than all the ones. Any question on this one? All right, move on. So um, let's move on. Another example. That's a picture. Okay, and then can I ask you, what do you see here? Um, it's a city, but the main focus of the photograph are the people. Okay, interesting. Yeah, some people. That's actually um, um, La Paz in, in Bolivia. <laughs> And, and you have a, a huge, the huge city down there. And as you will say, Kay, the main focus is these two people. Who are they? What are mm. they doing? Any idea? They don't look like they live in the city. Maybe they come from the country and they're looking towards the city. Yes, so, so those are um, Native Americans uh, from, from Bolivia. And, um. and it's, it's, it's interesting to see the contrast between the developed uh, city and the traditional ways of life and each one of them being separate from each other. And maybe we can start, try to put ourselves in the place of these Native Americans and think, what are they thinking about? What's going on in their minds? Uh, are they jealous? Are, the, uh, are they happy with what they see? So what am I saying that? Because one of the activities that I propose with this is a geography lesson. That's not history, that's geography. Uh, I wanted the students to discuss about cultural development. 
what cultural development is and to what extent cultural development may cause conflicts in lifestyle choices. That's what I want them to understand. So it's a, it's a tricky discussion to have because they don't realize that they belong to this cultural development. Generation Z haven't seen any world without internet. Uh, they don't understand the world where they live without this idea of cultural development. Now we can discuss what does it mean? What is it development? Do we all understand the same thing about development? Maybe some people want to develop, maybe some people don't want to. Or maybe development leads to globalization and, and eats away all the national cultures and, and languages and, and traditions and religions and so on. So basically what I've done, that was again, is a geography example, not history, sorry, it's a geography example. I picked the same tasks. I took a grasp activity and I've put there my statement of inquiry. Cultural development may cause conflicts of interest in lifestyle choices. As you can see, there's not a right or a wrong answer to this. It's an open-ended task, which is one of the intentions of the performance-based tasks. Open-ended, nothing right, nothing wrong. Some students will say, no, you know, um, I think the Native Americans should abandon their life and go back to the city and then work in the city and be part of the, you know, industry and so on. Now, I will give them the chance, but this time, for this year group, which was a year five, so 11 years old, 12 years old, I told them, you are a Native American living in the Amazon rainforest. That's who you are. And I'm going to ask you to go to the United Nations Assembly. And you are going to deliver a speech to the United Nations Assembly. And you're going to try to convince the United Nations that your habitat is disappearing due to the Amazon fires, and then you want them to realize what are the consequences in your way of life. And I want you to show them that there's a conflict of interest between the paper industry, the construction industry, and your way of life. So in this case, I'm giving them a biased point of view. I want them to take one role. But as you can imagine, that's another activity that you can leave it open. You can have a guy being the owner of a paper company, paper producing company. You can be the Brazilian president who's trying to get rid of part of the rainforest because of resources. Maybe you want to be, I don't know, there are many, many roles that you can take and those roles can end into a, a hot debate in class between pros and cons. Now, of course, this is a real life situation because this happened four years ago in the United Nations Assembly in New York. There was a Peruvian Native American that who was in, uh, sorry, Brazilian Native American who was invited to deliver a speech against the destruction of the um, rainforest. Maybe they don't know, but once they're going to produce that speech, our last session is going to be looking at the news and trying to go in depth about what that Native American said in the United Nations and see to what extent it fits into what they said in their speech. Any question? No? Yeah. Okay, move on then. And the last example that I have for you is for visual arts. Yeah, and maybe you've seen that. Uh, it is a typical activity. Um, um, and it's an activity related to the Renaissance. Um, you know, there was a, that, that's something that I saw in a class in India, by the way, it was in Mumbai. I loved it. The activity of these, these little ones was extraordinary. So I was visiting the class, uh, doing an authorization visit for the IB. And then um, I entered the class and then the students were um, sitting behind their beside their desk, trying to make a draw, a painting. So in the, in the wall, there was a painting of the Sistine Chapel of Michelangelo. You saw these, these two fingers when, when you know, the, the, the God mm. creating the man is a very famous one. So the students were drawing these, I mean, yeah, some of them were excited, some others were a little bit boring because they, you know, not, not, not lots of sense. And I just entered the class and I sat there for, for 10 minutes and the teacher tried to contextualize the Sistine Chapel. And he said, well, guys, you know, when we look at the Sistine Chapel, it's absolutely amazing but we don't realize how the Sistine Chapel was made. And the teacher had stuck under the desks a piece of paper. And all of a sudden he asked the students to stand up and to lay under the desks and do the same painting, but upside down, which is exactly how Michelangelo was painting the Sistine Chapel. 
he was making it upside down. So the level of enthusiasm on those students, just the fun aspect of doing that. And, and one little boy stood up and said, mom, I thought painting was easy, but now I really understand why Michelangelo was a, a, a great artist. Just because the boy was able to put himself into the context of the production of that particular piece of art. So I thought that was a, a brilliant activity. And then it wasn't a grasp, actually. This is just something that it was happening in class. So I just went back to school and I was talking to the visual arts teacher in my class and the history teacher. And I said, guys, what about doing something like that? Like an interdisciplinary unit between history and visual arts. So at the end, the visual arts teacher came up with this. It's okay, my stable inquiry will be to show that aesthetic of a piece of art changes when its context of creation is understood. So you can see a piece of art and think, I don't like it. It's actually very ugly. I hate that. But when you realize the context in when it was, it was made, all of a sudden you see, all right, that makes sense to me. Okay? So I'm thinking about design. How can you link design with the uh, ancient uh, aesthetic of cars uh, and the new ones? And, and how the design follows and you need to understand why cars were like that long ago and why they're different now. So I don't, just try to see how understanding the context of things can change. And of course, your role is that you're Michelangelo, an artist from the Renaissance. And your audience will be the Pope, Julius II. And the situation is that you're an artist from the Renaissance that has been asked to paint one of the most beautiful pieces of art in history. And the purpose of the project is to understand the circumstances and the context of the painting of the Sistine Chapel. So again, you can take any little experience that you have in your life, in the news, now with the COVID-19, I can tell there are so many teaching possibilities around that to convert real life situations into a classroom activity. Just making sure the students are able to transfer their knowledge. So by doing that, now I can understand so many other things. I can transfer what I've done in this performance based task in, in other subjects or other activities. Now, that's a proposal of assessment of a grasp activity. And it's good to have Kay here as a design teacher because what we've done in my school, we've used the design cycle to plan a grasp and to assess the grasp only on skills. So we've divided our grasp activity in four weeks following the four aspects of design cycle. The first week, we've asked our students to investigate. We've asked them to define a clear goal for the project. We've asked them to think about their prior knowledge. And we've asked them to develop certain skills. They were working in groups. They need to develop critical thinking to define about what project they want to do. Creative thinking about the product, an original product, and transfer. The second week, we asked them to plan their project. And we followed little by little, step by step, the design cycle. The fourth week, we've asked them to take action. And the fifth week, we've asked them to reflect. So after all these weeks, we have brilliant projects, very different from each other, videos, songs, typical PowerPoint presentations, books, leaflets. Um, um, lots of things have been produced by the students. But instead of using typical IB criteria to give grades out of eight or out of seven, we decided doing this online work, we're not going to give you grades on numbers, guys. We're going to give you overall feedback. And what we're going to do, we're going to ask you to develop just, just the skills. And how are we going to assess the skills? Well, we came up with another proposal, which is this one. Sorry. Oh, I don't have it here, but I'll share it with you. We just divide the skills between learn, learner, practitioner, or expert. We came up with this, but you can come up with any way of assessing skills, but get away from numbers. Get away from, because numbers lead to failing, to passing, get away from numbers. Just come up with um, a grasp activity, open, give them the chance to decide what they want to do, what subjects they want to work on, give them maybe some concepts, 
And then they will use whichever subject they want. They will be looking for supervisors. Oh, I, like, I would like to do something on maths. Let's go to my maths teacher. I want to do some investigation on maths or my science or my history teacher. And let them follow this design cycle, which is excellent. And every week, give them one bit. And at the end of the week, have a session with them and reflect. Guys, this week you've been investigating. Let's reflect. What have you done in your investigation? What ATLs have you developed? Has it worked well? Second week. Okay, guys, let's take it from the second week. Let's plan. And at the end of the week, reflect. Take action. End of the week, reflect. And the last one is a reflection of the whole process and try to see how can they make things better for the next time. So this is what we do right now at JBS online. It works. Uh, of course, we have students more motivated than others. That will always happen. But at least we've been able to get away from the typical teaching lessons, pressure on teachers, pressure on students, let them work in collaboration, in groups, give them long deadlines with little mini deadlines. They will develop self-assessment strategies. They will develop management skills. They will develop critical thinking, individual learners, and it does work. Now, I don't know to what extent it will work in your school if you want to try, but if you do, I'll be very happy if you share your experience with me. So, that was it. Um, there's a, um, a few resources there. Um, if you want to screenshot, these are the ones that I've used. Um, some resources for secondary, the, the first ones for primary there. And if you want to find out more about Generation Z, that's the, um, the source that I used to, to define. Um, again, we're all facing different times and difficult times with these online things. Um, but I think the GRASP activities work well, not only for online, but once we're going to go back to school, um, it's something that is worth trying with the students because it gives them the ownership of their own learning and, and it has worked. Yeah. Guys, any question? No. Hi, David, I have a question. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Kay, Kay you no. can go ahead. No, no, I was just saying thank you. You go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Um, so I was asking if you would have a task specific clarification for um, a task like this. Uh, the ones that I produced, I used MYP task, but I can try to ask teachers from my school to see if they can share that with you. Because I know that the only task specific clarification we've created are the ones based on ATL, which are basically this planning of the project and using um, uh, the ATL, you know, learner, practitioner, and expert. And at the end, it's very subjective because every teacher will have different interpretation of what it is. That's why we standardized assessment. And that's why when the students are presenting their project, there are always two or three teachers listening to. Not only the supervisor, the one that has been working with them for the five last weeks, but also teachers from other subjects. So they can discuss what do we think uh, a learner is in terms of skills development. So that's the only one that we've produced separately as success criteria, different from the MYP criteria. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Any other question, guys? Oh, that was good. Hopefully it's because it's clear. <laughs> well, guys, then, then, then that's it from me. Thank you very much for being here. The session has been recorded. I will try to see if we can upload it on the, on the website, all with all the other sessions that have been recorded. So if you want to go back and have a look, hopefully it will be there. Okay? Okay, thank you. Excellent, take care of yourself and stay safe. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you so much, David. My pleasure, take care.